Welcome to the Cutting Edge Health Preventing Cognitive Decline podcast. I'm Jane Rogers. Welcome back. Dr. Yoshi Ram is our guest today. We're taking a deep dive into the use of extracorporeal blood oxygenation and ozonation, better known as EBU, for boosting your immune system. We also get into the use of methylene blue to help some of the underlying issues that can lead to cognitive decline. Briefly, Dr. Ram founded Oasis Family Medicine in Glendale, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. He's a board-certified osteopathic family physician. So, Yoshi, I'm very glad to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. We're going to unpack two things to start with that I think are very exciting for this community trying to prevent cognitive decline. The first one has to do with a special ozone treatment called EBU, and which I'm a big fan of. And the second one has to do with methylene blue, which I also can really see the efficacy in. So tell us, first of all, how you got into this? I, I want to hear your story. Yes. Why are, why are you um, focusing on helping people with Lyme and, and the kind of practice that you have established? Yeah, it's, um, it's really through my family. I grew up in Northern California, and my mom was probably one of the earlier people that we recognized or that was recognized to have had Lyme. And so she's... Mm -hmm had it for 40 years, you know, maybe even a little longer than 40 years. And so I grew up with her, that kind of that health concern. And then my brother had meningitis and after that had epilepsy growing up. And so I was always a little bit more exposed to um, ideas of healthy and it being Northern California, my parents were hippies. And so I kind of mm -hmm. had that more natural healing um, tendency around mm -hmm. me. Uh, and so then when I went to, I was like, I think mostly because of my brother, I wanted to go to medical school and, and mm -hmm. went through residency and in residency, I was definitely like, okay, there's a lot to this Western medicine, um, absolutely has its place. I could see where it did, uh, in the emergency room surgeries, right. When necessary, absolutely beautiful things, but it became so clear to me that from a chronic disease management standpoint, it just was not not the best option out mm -hmm. there. And so yeah. Yeah. it was very much, okay, what can I add into my toolbox here? And I started my practice right away. Within a year, my dad got diagnosed with ALS. And oh so oh. while I was already kind of on my path towards um, getting more holistic education to, mm -hmm. to again, add to my toolbox, um, you know, ALS being kind of, quote, irreversible, right. um, at least at the time, uh, you know, I just went down the rabbit hole. And so at that point, it was just everything I could came in contact with. How can I learn more about this? Is this appropriate for my practice the way I want to practice medicine? Or do I learn about it to be able to refer people, patients mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to that, uh, to a person who's an expert in that particular area of healing. And so I just, it's really, yes, I'm a physician, I'm a doctor, but really I, I, I want to think of myself as a healer. And, you know, it's when someone comes in front of me, it's how can we, how can I teach that person to heal themselves? And that's, that's kind of my framework. And that's how I came into this, to where I'm at today and, and being that healer at whatever level I am at, always trying to get better. There's so much to learn. And I, I just, I have this like undying passion for learning more and more. And I wish I could know it all, but I know I never will be. And the more <laughs> I learn, the more I know I don't know, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wish we could clone you. We need many, many more practitioners who are as passionate as you are, Yoshi. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into this. You are doing something with ozone in your practice that it, it not every practice does. And tell me about it. Tell me, first of all, what's the efficacy of ozone? Why should someone even want to consider that if they want to make sure that they stay cognitively healthy as they age? Yes. Uh, so you were referring, you mentioned EBU earlier on. Mm -hmm. Extracorporeal blood oxygenation and ozonation is what EBU stands for. Um, but first, I just want to kind of set the pre premise that there's a lot of different types of ozone therapy, and it goes from being very uh, non-invasive, so mm -hmm. 
people can do home rectal ozone or vaginal ozone. Uh, and then you can kind of get into a more of a medical office and do some um, major autohemotherapy where they take out a little bit of your blood, put it in a bag, and then inject some ozone into that blood and it becomes ozonated and then it just gets dripped back into a person kind of like a normal IV almost. And and then there's a couple of other modalities out there, but it's kind of like the the biggest step up is this EBU therapy. And it's it's a little bit more invasive because it's um you know it, it's usually two arms, so a vein coming out and the blood goes through this machine where it gets ozonated mm -hmm. and oxygenated, and then it comes around and comes back into typically the other arm. And the beauty of this EBU machine is that it gets it, there's a huge there's a filter, and so there's this huge surface area where ozone and oxygen can come in contact with lots of blood on a continuous basis. And we can do it at very gentle uh, ozone concentrations of ozone so that the body really handles a massive amount of ozone, but handles it very well so that very few people actually get a Herxheimer's or a detoxification type of reaction, which is usually a signal that you're kind of on the right path, but probably doing too much of it, mm -hmm. right? Too much you're, of anything is not a good thing. Yeah. You're killing and, something too quickly and it can't get out of your body is a Herxheimer reaction. Yeah. For those who haven't yeah, heard of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, just to kind of back up a little bit, I kind of dove right into Ibu, but ozone you know, what does ozone do, right? It's what, mm -hmm. why is it good for people? And it's really, I think of it as three main pillars that it does. It lowers unwanted inflammation in the body. Inflammation is not always a bad thing. When we get an acute infection, we actually want a little infl inflammatory burst mm -hmm. to kill it off. If we get a little cut, we want a little local inflammation to make sure we don't get an infection. So inflammation is not always bad, but chronic unwanted inflammation is very bad mm -hmm. and contributes to a lot of chronic disease states. So it lowers unwanted inflammation, and then it also balances out the immune system. And so if your immune system is not working well enough, it can really rev it up. And if it's overactive, if you're using the right dosages of ozone, it can actually lower it down. Hmm. And so it's kind of, I think of it as like, I think of it as you know, Star Wars balancing the force really is mm -hmm. what it does from, mm -hmm. from both an inflammation standpoint and an immune system standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then I think of kind of a third pillar of what ozone does as increasing energy in the body at the cellular level. And most of energy in the body is really kind of the final product, the currency of energy in the body is ATP. Mm -hmm. And it's produced by the mitochondria, which are in many cells in the body. And when we, when our body has enough energy, when it has enough ATP, it can heal itself so much better. And unfortunately we live in a toxic world and there's so many toxins mm -hmm. that really tamp down yeah. our ability to create energy at the mitochondrial level. And so very few people are actually making energy optimally. And so if we can get more energy production, again, like I already said, it, it leads to a more optimal healing prognosis. And when you're talking about cognitive decline, you've got to have that energy. You've, you need to have the mitochondria really humming Otherwise, they're finding um, post-mortem autopsies that there's a really a mitochondrial insufficiency going on. And that's one of the drivers for a lot of the, the cognitive decline, the Alzheimer's and the bodily inflammation. You know, you don't you don't want bodily inflammation if you are going to age well and keep your ability to, ability to remember things. Yeah. And, you know, on the brain, cognitive decline, mitochondria, mm -hmm. different tissues in the body have different amounts of mitochondria. And so a lot you, some people might hear the mitochondria is like the, the engine of the cell, mm -hmm. right? And 
um, or I think of it more of like a furnace that's producing energy. Mm -hmm. And certain tissues, again, have more mitochondria and the brain is like the, where the most mitochondria are. There's some other areas, mm -hmm. ovaries are very high, rich in mitochondria, heart is very rich in mitochondria, but brain, it's where most of our energy um, production is actually occurring mm -hmm. at, at the mitochondrial level because our brain needs it, right? Without our mm -hmm. brain, I mean, we can even have mechanical hearts nowadays, right? We can do lung, mm -hmm. we can do lung transplants, we can do liver transplants, we can kind of switch out a lot of our organs, but the brain is like, obviously, <laughs> we're not close to that yet. <laughs> probably never will be. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> so tell me about the research that's been done. Has there been any real good research done in ozone? And that we know for the skeptics out there saying, do I really want to do this? Is it really going to help my brain? Yeah, good question. So it's been used from a therapeutic standpoint for mm -hmm. a century, a full on okay. century. Now, it didn't probably gain a lot of traction until the 1950s, probably more like 1960s, uh, mm -hmm. more in Europe, especially Germany. But it's been used a lot um, since the 1960s, 1970s. So we're talking 50 years, millions of therapies over this mm -hmm. period of time. I mean, such a low risk profile, just from an anecdotal standpoint. And, you know, when something stands the test of time, there's probably something to it. Um, now there is, there's definitely been actually a decent amount of research on various ozone therapies. Uh, in, in my office, we actually just did, we've, we've, in the past 12 months, we actually completed two rounds of EBU studies. And- Great. Yeah, and um, the the second round that we just did over this past summer of 2023, uh, we had 20 patients, did three sessions, three EBU sessions each, and then we pulled them in a week later, um, and we were doing blood work along the way and having them fill out some subjective criteria as well, mm -hmm. or subjective feedback as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't, it's like, Going into it, I thought that we would have good results or kind of quote good results, but you'd, you'd never really know. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, there's definitely a certain amount of blinding in this study and, you know, sent off to someone else to run the statistics. And it was really interesting because it, we ran a before and after like cytokine panel. So okay. cytokines are the there's a lot of cytokines but some of the more well-known ones have a lot to do with immune system and mm -hmm. inflammation um over the past you know since 2020 we've heard the cytokine storm right that's mm -hmm. not right. a desirable thing we don't we don't want a cytokine storm um and so we we looked at this cytokine panel 18 different cytokines some inflammatory some pro some anti-inflammatory ones and overall the, uh, it's Cytokines are kind of like a bowl of spaghetti. They're very mixed and it's hard to know exactly what's doing what. But overall, the trend was definitely in a good direction. So three EB sessions, one week apart, and then even one week later, um, cytokines mm -hmm. improved. Now, another probably, there's kind of, there's a few other things I can share if you. I would like um, that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please. Okay. Um, CRP, HSCRP, so that's a general inflammation marker. Um, that was shown to decrease, not just from like right before the session, each session to right after the session, but truly one week after even that third session, um, shown to decrease, uh, I believe that was 14% on average. Okay. And then there was uh, fibrinogen, which is a... It's an inflammation marker, but a little bit to do with blood stickiness as well. And um, we don't, we don't, most people's blood is a little too sticky. And so mm -hmm. we want to generally bring it down because I very, very infrequently see somebody who is, is too low. Most okay. people's are too high. So it's too sticky of blood. And what we saw was a definite decrease by, that one was about 24% or 25%, I believe. Um, so very significant numbers. Mm -hmm. And in almost everybody. And, did you and do, in everybody. 
Specific. Did you do lipid panels? No, no lipid panels. Okay. On Next this time. One. Yeah, in I've anecdotally I can say that it lowers um, or kind of it, it lowers total cholesterol. Not that that's the the end goal really. Yeah. You want to improve the quality of the cholesterol, and I can say anecdotally that it improves, mm -hmm. um, but I don't have any like kind of official research to mm -hmm. to sh prove that, or at least on these studies. Um, and then there was another one. Uh, sed rate or ESR, and that's a that's a huge blood stickiness uh, marker, and that actually decreased by a hundred and uh, over a hundred and twenty percent. Oh my! And that's just three sessions. Really phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it would happen even just with one session. Mm -hmm. So it was like twofold. These changes improved over even just one session, mm -hmm. but then it was interesting because we wanted to see does it last, right? And yeah. In this study, we we only carried it out one week, so that's all we can say we know. Mm -hmm. um, but it it truly lasted; the effects lasted. Which mm -hmm. and and for the sed rate, it was almost just as much. It was like one hundred and thirty five percent just from before to right after one session or each session. But then even one week later, it was one hundred and twenty four percent. So wow. almost just as much. Which that was really that was kind of. That was a big one to find and really um, interesting. And, and, I, and I can say anecdotally that probably one EBU session, probably la like the effects last, I suspect somewhere in the three to six week range. Okay. Okay. Um, but again, that's, that's more anecdotally. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that was really neat to, to do that study. SOTMED funded part of it. So, mm -hmm. and they have an EBU machine. And so th that was really great of them to, to see. Because it's like we we think we know what we know, but we don't <laughs> until we do. That's really impressive for us, a, a relatively small practice like that, to, to start yeah. into that kind of research. That's cool. Yeah, it was honestly, it was the first time we've ever done any kind of research and took a little work up front, but yeah. um, have a really awesome team. So we were able to I do bet. it and thank you to have done it. Now, tell me about what you add to the EBU treatments. You're That's where... You, I've seen you as being especially innovative and people come to you from all over the country, all over the world, because you really know what you're doing. You don't just do the, the ozone, the EBU treatment. You, you kind of add things in. Yeah. Yeah. And so something also that we kind of found from the, that study was there's, there's some other like minor electrolyte shifts and, mm. um, you know, Ibu, when you're giving a huge dose of ozone, because ozone speeds up metabolism, you can get a potentially, a, if, if you're not metabolically flexible, you can get a huge blood sugar drop. We can kind of, we can easily mitigate that just by having people eat um, a well-rounded meal before doing this session. Um, blood, blood pressure, like just be well hydrated. So there's a few things that we've been working through. We, we first did this, um, a, built my own Ibu machine. And we started doing this three years ago, October of 2020. And since then we've done 1500 of these sessions. So it's a lot of sessions where, and it's been a learning process, you know, and I've always, always try to be upfront with um, talking to patients about, you know, potential pros, potential cons, and being mm -hmm. totally honest, like, this is what we know, and this is what we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, we've gone through this. And I also realized there's a lot of um, people who have, so there's this other kind of category of vasovagal response that people can get when they do an EBU session, which is typically minor, but it doesn't seem minor to the patient in the, in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized this happens more with what I call brittle autonomic, uh, brittle autonomics. So, and that really comes down to anybody who has any amount of anxiety, whether it's like robust, obvious anxiety, mm -hmm. or even if people sometimes try to play it cool and uh, walk in, but there's really this like under level, underlying mm -hmm. level of nervousness, um, whether it's about the session or just in life in general, um, those are the individuals who seem to have vasovagal type of symptoms. And so we give them uh, this pre-EBU -nutri pre nutrient IV, and it's got different ratios of different electrolytes and vitamins basically to help calm 
that person out and um, just really bring them into a state of equilibrium. Mm-hmm. And so that's been that that's something that really came out of all those experiences, individual experiences, but then also the study. So it was neat to do that. And um, yeah, and we also add in. I'm a huge fan of, I mean, this is, we could spend probably too long on this, but I add in a lot of fulvic acids uh, too, oh. because um, ozone can really stimulate phase one and phase two uh, detox um, symptoms. Uh, so again, kind of at the beginning, we talked about too much of a good thing can create a detox reaction or a Herxheimer's reaction. Mm-hmm. And so I want to, neutralizes many of those toxins that get mobilized during a process like an ebu session or that might be mobilized how do we how do we bind those really mm-hmm. well and effectively so that they don't cause some unwanted fatigue for example mm-hmm. that later that day or maybe the day after or get reabsorbed so, back into the body which you don't exactly. want exactly yeah exactly like if we're going to mobilize it yeah we might as well take it out mm-hmm. Um, so fulvic acids, if you're taking a good quality fulvic acid, it can actually go, um, into the gut, but then it can actually go out of, outside of the gut and, um, into all the tissues, including the brain, which, I mean, that's, that's the big one. Um, and it can grab those toxins, whether you're talking about heavy metals like lead, mercury, pesticides, herbicides, mold, leftovers, mold biotoxins, um, parasite exoskeletons. It can bind, it has the ability to bind a lot of different um, toxins. Mm -hmm. And, and so if we, so we've found that if we do a good amount of that, we can also, again, work in tandem with huge amounts of ozone and oxygen. Um, Yeah. And then occasionally we'll throw in some methylene blue as well. Um, that's not like a standard thing that we do with everybody. Um, I'm a huge fan of just trying something and seeing mm-hmm. how it goes. And then we can kind of course adjust, right? mm-hmm. getting on the ship to go from California to Japan. I just want to kind of continue to course adjust so that we don't mm-hmm. end up somewhere totally, you know, Alaska or Australia. Right. And so methylene blue is one of those things that we, Oftentimes, like a second or third session, we might try it and see how a person responds to it, Mm -hmm. too. And we'll talk more in a minute about the benefits, the many benefits of methylene blue. So in the ideal world, if you think that the the effects of an EBU session last for three to six weeks, how often are you personally getting an EBU session? Do you get Mm -hmm. one every every month? Or are you yeah, like the cobbler's kid? You don't get it very often because you, yeah. Kid. yeah. <laughs> what an embarrassing question well, to be asked. Yeah, I'm no, sorry. I, no, no, it's totally cool. I, I, um, I, I would. So I'm a pretty healthy person. I'm yes. fortunate enough. I don't have any chronic situations going on. So I would, in an ideal world, I would probably do it once a quarter. Once a quarter, um, okay. someone who's biohacking, you know, again, really just kind of health, pretty darn healthy, like eating well, exercising well, doing doing the lifestyle stuff pretty well. Mm-hmm. Nobody's perfect on that, but just pretty well. I would go once a quarter. Okay. Um, but then it, it's more and more frequent the more sick someone is or the more in need somebody is of a healing process to occur. So if someone's in the throes of, um, a Lyme flare-up or, or mold, um, then it could be once a week for two or three weeks. and then. Mm-hmm. But then I like to pretty quickly kind of start spreading that out um, every two weeks and then every three weeks. And then, mm-hmm. So I, I tend to find people generally don't need to be doing it every week or every two weeks mm-hmm. for that long, which is nice. Good. Good. And so how can someone go about finding a good EBU practitioner? Because I've seen in different offices, a lot of variations in machines. Some of the machines look a little bit old and some of them do you think, okay, this one's state of the art. This is new. Is that something that should concern me? And how do you find a good practitioner for it? You know, I actually don't have a great answer to how to find a good practitioner. Um, There are different types of machines out there. Um, you know, I think it's not so much just about a machine. It's about how a practitioner uses the machine, right? Mm-hmm. Because I can have a hammer. We can all have the same hammer, 
<laughs> but if we're hammering the same force on everything, that's it might work for some people, but it's not going to work for everything. Um, so what I I mean, all I can talk about is my experience. So this mm -hmm. is not going to be to knock on anybody else's machines out there. Mm -hmm. But I can say this, a practitioner who has the SOTMED machine, um, because they do do the training, they what I can say about SOTMED is they um, are very interested in continually improving their machine. I, I know for a fact that they're very active on that. They didn't just create a machine and like they're Leave gonna it. be good with that mm -hmm. for the next 10 years, right? They're mm -hmm. going, they are in the process of actively improving it. Um, so I'm I'm totally not knocking anybody else's machine out there. I again I can just speak that I know that a practitioner who has a SOPMED machine is probably a safe bet. So okay. at this point, there, you know, when I started, when I, when I, <laughs> I actually built my Eboo machine without even knowing Eboo was a thing. I, it just was one of those things that made sense to me. So wow. when I first started doing it, 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 there definitely were probably only like three or four, maybe five people out in the U S doing it. Um, fortunately it's becoming more and more common, which is great because <laughs> there's so many people out there who need, who would benefit from Eboo. Um, and so it's 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 on the rise very rapidly. That's what I can say. But if if someone Googles it and then calls them up, do you use the SOTMED machine? They're probably a good option, is my okay. guess. Okay. Um, but also caveat that with there's a lot of other wonderful eBoo practitioners out there who are using other machines as well. And one last question about eBoo, and then we'll kind of wrap that up and move on to methylene blue. But how much is this going to set a person back to do a session or maybe a, a, a group of three sessions? Yeah. So in my office, we it's right around a thousand dollars per session. And per session. Yeah. Okay. And most offices, I mean, there's definitely offices out there that are charging like $3,500, $5,000 for one session. I would say your average is probably closer to like $1,500 to $2,000 a session. So it's, it's definitely not um, an inexpensive therapy. <laughs> uh, and what I can say is this is, this is a this is a process that where you have to have the nurse. It's like one nurse for one patient there the whole time you're getting the blood. It's almost like a dialysis session. I mean, in a way, because the blood is going out, it's going through a machine coming back into you. And you just, it's really important to have eyes on, on that one person for the whole session. So it's a lot of, um, human power in, mm -hmm. involved. Um, and then you gotta, you can't reuse the, the whole filter on a, another pay on a second patient, right? It's one, one filter, um, one tubing filter set per patient. So there's a lot of cost to it. Uh, having said that though, in the last three years, I've definitely seen the overall cost, um, from other offices kind of come down and down, which is kind of a natural thing that happens over time. Anytime there's a newer technology, right? It starts out a little bit more expensive and then hopefully comes down over time. So, Good. but Good. it's, it, it definitely can set people back. And what I'll also say on that front is, you know, we, we've had people who repeatedly come from other states for these session because it, it, it has really moved the needle for them. And so, you know, and, and that's, that's Ibu is never my first line. Like I don't just because we do Ibu in our office, it's not like, oh, everybody who walks in the door should get an Ibu session. Like it's really important to be doing all of the other things, not all of the other things, but like be doing the ba the basic lifestyle modifications mm -hmm. as like getting a decent grade on each of those first, you know, and then just kind of where are we deficient on something, where are we toxic on something, be working on those, maybe perhaps try some of the other simpler IV therapies, like even just a major auto hemotherapy version of ozone potentially, right? See, see how somebody responds to that. If they respond really great to that, maybe they never even need to go to EBU. Um, and yet having said all of that, sometimes people still want the needle to be moved more. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it's like, okay, let's try an EBU session and see how you respond. And then we just see if it's worth it to you. Not, not just from a financial standpoint, but like worth your time, money, 
effort, mm -hmm. all of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Anything else before we move on that you want to talk about um, with, with Oh, there's Ozan. so much we could. I know. No, I, <laughs> I, think we, I think we did a pretty good job of okay. hitting the highlights there. So you mentioned at one point that you sometimes put methylene blue into that line when you're doing Ibu. Methylene blue, tell us about it. What is it? Yeah, so methylene blue is, it's actually a dye. It's a synthetic, um, it is a synthetic medication, although it's over the counter. Um, it's, most people think of it more like a, a supplement, but it is actually, it went on, it was the first drug on patent back in the 1880s. And it, initially it was used for, to treat malaria, which is a parasite. And um, so it's kind of, it was, it was one of the first ones, um, but then it was for, it's been, it was kind of forgotten for a number mm -hmm. of decades. And, and now just, it's in, it's been interesting, uh, myself included, like I didn't, you know, when I started my practice in 2011, I, I had only heard about methylene blue being used in the emergency room for uh, carbon monoxide poisoning or cyanide poisoning. Um, and I had no idea that it had so many other potentially useful benefits. Um, now, what I'll say is it people hear, oh, it's a dye. It's a synthetic dye. Do I really want to be taking it? And um, so while I would say our body definitely does not have a deficiency of methylene blue, <laughs> right? I like to kind of highlight that because I'm always trying to focus on how do we bring down toxins and how do we fix or help deficiencies, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of the first things that we're doing. But then it's like, okay, what can we, what else can we use, right? That might be mm -hmm. beneficial. And methylene blue is on that same kind of line of thought. And what else can we use that doesn't have a very high side effect risk, right? Mm -hmm. That's another huge piece of it. So if we can try something and there's like almost no downside to using it, um, hey, why don't we try it? Especially if it's very affordable. Methylene blue is very affordable, mm -hmm. um, especially by eBay standards. Uh, and so why is it so useful though? Um, well, first of all, I'll talk, I'll con let me continue about the side effects. The side effects, um, uh, like it's only, it's only potentially harmful if you're using it in very high doses. Okay. okay. Now we're talking over maybe 500 milligrams. Now, how much do we use in our practice? I'm usually recommending one milligram to a day, maybe up to as high as 70 milligrams in a day, depending on the person's situation. So we're so the dangerous realm is more like 500 milligrams and probably honestly more like over a thousand, even 4,000 milligrams. So you use any, but anything mm -hmm. in too much, it's going to be a bad thing, mm -hmm. of course. So I wouldn't use it in mega, mega high doses, at least all the time. I wouldn't use it if you're pregnant. But other than that, it's pretty darn safe, um, how about, especially when you're using it in low doses. How about with um, uh, antidepressants? Yeah, so there's anybody who Googles it will be like warned not to use it with antidepressants. And again, in the kind of the, the case studies where that was noted to be a dangerous combination, that was in people in um, who, again, were getting those mega doses, oh. okay? Open surgeries on the parathyroid who were ha literally having, um, during surgery, were having methylene blue being poured on them because it's a very good stain um, because it gets concentrated in the mitochondria, which is a good thing mm -hmm. um, and why it's used. Um, and then that person, those people are also noted to be on antidepressants. And so again, we're talking in mega, mega doses. If, if someone's using uh, 70 milligrams or less, uh, I don't believe that there's a single report out there. I could be wrong and I'm happy to be corrected on this, but I don't believe there's a single report out there of methylene blue at again, like a 70 milligram or less dosage, mm -hmm. um, interacting negatively with antidepressants. And you're, you're talking per day, 
70 milligrams per day because it stays in your body, some people longer than others. So do you wait until you see your pee returning to the normal yellow color? It's not blue anymore or green before you take it or? Yeah, great then question. It becomes so, yeah, so the half-life of methylene blue is approximately 12 hours. Again, it depends on the person's mm -hmm. kind of health status, frankly. Um, and, and, and I actually don't recommend people take it every day. Again, I, I'm... I'm like, my personal stance is less is more typically, hmm. um, or I would say rather lowest effective dose. That's that's probably more accurate of a statement. It's like, where is that dose that is effective? Because the moment we get over a certain dose where we're not really getting any extra benefit, it's mm -hmm. probably a sign that we don't really need that. And it probably is too much. And, and um, it's still the synthetic thing. So when I'm backing up. Um, anybody, the beautiful thing about methylene blue is it goes right to the mitochondria. Again, very few people out there have perfectly functioning mitochondria. Okay. The healthiest of the healthiest probably don't need to be taking methylene blue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, for the rest of individuals, um, anybody who could use a little bit better, uh, mitochondrial energy production, methylene blue might be a good idea to start mm -hmm. trying or using, or at least trying. Right. And so myself, I actually only use methylene blue if I'm wanting a cognitive enhancement kind of uh, temporarily, if I'm going to be taking a test, I'll use methylene blue. Um, for my, myself or my patients, if they feel like they're coming down with something like a, a virus or a bacterial infection, um, that's a really great time to get methylene blue on board. If someone wants to use it as a nootropic, so to help again, cognitive, it's basically cognitive enhancement um, for whatever reason, uh, I would potentially use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, say, say you have a student in uh, college going to classes five days a week. I mean, it could be like, use it five days a week. I would always take, take a couple days off. But again, I would be using it. I would be suggesting that dosage to be somewhere around maybe four to 30 milligrams. Mm -hmm. So not even a a 70 milligram dosage. Mm -hmm. The higher the dosage goes, the more of an anti-infective it is. So in my office, if we have, it works so well on um, UTIs or chronic UTIs, mm -hmm. we will, they'll come in and we'll give them up to 30 milligrams intravenously. And then that methylene blue concentrates in the bladder and it can act as a um, oxidant, basically a pro-oxidant in the bladder as it concentrates there um, and basically kill off an acute UTI infection. But a lot of people also have chronic UTIs. And mm -hmm. so, and it's like so many people are given round after round of antibiotics needlessly mm -hmm. when they could just be taking methylene blue, which actually is like helping their <laughs> cognition, helping their anywhere there's a mitochondria. Um, if there's inflammation anywhere in the body, it's like it's helping all of that. And then it also just like oftentimes one session. Um, and then I actually kind of side tangent. We also like to put red and infrared light on over the bladder area during those IV sessions. Okay. So that can be, be hugely beneficial. I mean, I think... I don't think I'm wrong on this, but I think every person that has come in with a chronic UTI who has tried that, it's just been completely neutralized. Wow. And in like long term neutralized. I find it interesting that you say don't take it every day. Because if the mitochondria needs support, you would think, okay, you take that not a lot of it, but you take it every day. But you're saying no, 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 no. Just take it periodically when your day needs it. I think so. I think okay. if you get, um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll also add to that. If I get a really bad night's sleep, so again, mm -hmm. I'm pretty healthy, but if I get a bad night's sleep, I have three little kids and a practice to run, right? Like I get mm -hmm. bad night's sleep sometimes. Yeah. Um, that would be a great time to use methylene blue. Also dosage matters, right? So if someone's taken four milligrams of methylene blue, for instance, um, probably could take it every day without any issue. But I think where 
it also might be possible to take 100 milligrams of methylene blue every day and for it not to be a problem. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that research has really been um, well delineated yet. And so because it's a synthetic thing that our body does not naturally produce, I tend to want to reach towards other sources, other healthy sources to also enhance the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how many people are doing a little, able to do a little bit of intermittent fasting because that helps improve mitochondrial mm -hmm. function, right? It's like how many people are doing their cardiovascular exercise, which is more just like slow, continuous exercise. Mm -hmm. um, how many people are doing those quick bursts of exercise, like hard bursts of exercise, because those are really the best ways to, and then eating a clean diet that's toxin free or as toxin free as we can. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because those are the real ways to enhance the mitochondria, getting amazing sleep, keeping well hydrated, um, preferably with structured water um, or mineralized water, keeping our minerals up, like, almost everybody is mineral deficient to some level. And so if we're doing all of those other things, we're not going to need to take this synthetic methylene blue. Excellent. However, there is also absolutely, like I just said, I get a poor night's sleep sometime. I go through time periods where I'm not exercising well or enough, right? Like I, I have a, we live in this world, this busy world. And so there's absolutely this huge opportunity to use methylene blue for a lot of good for the, for a person, for, for a person. Um, but I just, there's a lot to kind of tear apart there or to pull apart there. Mm -hmm. And so I really just think it matters um, who the person is and what their situation is and what they're hoping to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And then trying, starting on a low dose and tapering up, taking note of what they notice Right. Because if you're noticing an improvement in cognition, it's probably a sign that methylene blue is a really good thing. But if there comes a, a, a certain dosage where you're like, I'm not really noticing something, um, I'm just saying potentially maybe that's kind of the max dose that you need. Mm -hmm. Right. That, um, that makes sense. I, I have um, another methylene blue real quickly. Methylene mm -hmm. blue goes to where the body needs it most, wherever there's an energy deficiency. That's mm -hmm. where methylene blue goes. And that's, that's like one of the power, the beautiful things about it. And we probably should add, if someone's getting into this, they need USP grade. Mm. Yes. Super I'm glad important. You mentioned that. Yes. Um, there's a lot of methylene blue on the market. It, I mean, it got kind of a negative connotation during the earlier pandemic when people were trying to use it, but using like fish tank grade. Um, it is used as a fish tank cleaner, but it's not really a fish tank cleaner. It's actually for the fish themselves to decrease infections in the fish. So the same reason we give it to the fish, like we can take it, but there's a lot of um, adulterated methylene blue out there. And so it's really, really important to get a, a high quality source mm -hmm. that is just completely free of toxins. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. Um, and one other question that I have, I have um, mutations within the methyl methylation pathway. I am I have something in the COMT plus area that makes it hard for my body to take in more methyls. And so here I am thinking, OK, I'll take methylene blue. But what I found is it drives my homocysteine really low, like 5.3, which is really too, too low. Is this an indication this is not the right thing for me, even though it does help me cognitively a lot? In your I, opinion. That is really, that's really fascinating. And so I would go a lot more off of symptoms okay. than a laboratory test. Mm -hmm. Because labs, the objective data is really awesome. But if you're noticing an enhancement, mm -hmm. a I cognitive am. enhancement, mm -hmm then to me, that's a really good thing. And this is also another case to like demonstrate, make sure you're on the lowest effective dose, right? So I yep. don't know if, if you know off the top of your head how much your dosing is. Right um, now, I had been taking five milligrams, but I was taking it every day. But then uh, my practitioner just bumped me up to 24 milligrams. Yeah, so, and so uh, test it out. 
right? Okay. Does does 24 milligrams help more than five milligrams or more than 10 mm. milligrams? Because, five milligrams did it. Yeah. So it'll be really interesting. I don't, have you tried the 24 milligrams I, yet? I have. Mm -hmm. And that also helps, I would assume. It, from it helps too. And it's easier to take. This one happens to be in capsule form instead of taking yeah. the drops. The drops are so messy. They get all over. They, they yes. get on the counter. They stain the counter if you don't put Dawn on it to clean it up. And yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my, my take is lowest effective dose because you also want to pay attention to the objective markers as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you don't know until you test and until you subjectively test as mm -hmm. well, that what being on 24 milligrams, is that blood marker going to go even lower? Exactly. Right? That's what I'm worried about. That's where I would just like, I would test it and kind of take note does, mm -hmm. because if it stays the same, huh? Okay. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe 24 milligrams is like a great dose right. for you. Yeah. Have you tried troscriptions? No. The little trochee by any chance? No, I haven't. Yeah. So no affiliation with them, but mm -hmm. they do have, um, so troscriptions.com, like trochee plus prescription, troscription. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's with an S or not, but .com. They have um, a few little products. One, pure methylene blue, good quality for sure. And it comes in, I think the trochee is 16 milligrams, but it can pretty easily be cut into quarters. So you can mm -hmm. do like four, four milligrams at a time. So that could be another option to try. They also have a really cool one. It's, I think it's called blue canatine. Um, that's actually what I use before my board exam questions. Cause it has like methylene blue plus one milligram of, I think it's one milligram, one or two milligrams of nicotine, and then like a oh. super low dose of caffeine, and then a super low dose of uh, CBD. And it's just like, that's a really amazing combo. Oh, you're All in really, up. really low dosage is, mm -hmm. so it's like this really calm energy, calm, in, calm energy, calm focus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what great. was that called again, Yoshi? Uh, I think it's blue canatine from Troscriptions. Troscriptions.com, I okay. think is the website. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned anything else on methylene blue before we wrap this up and talk about structured water just briefly, because you mentioned it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, no, I, again, it's kind of one of those things where I could talk another hour easily on methylene blue, but I think we got the highlights again. Excellent. Now, talk about structured water. I've heard you say that, that there's an easy, inexpensive way to make structured water. You don't have to get those special things to go under the sink. Yeah. Um, so, so it's interesting. I'll just kind of real quickly, mitochondria mentioned those are like the main furnaces, energy producers mm -hmm. in our body. And yet when, when and anybody can kind of delve into the science, what's really fascinating is the numbers that we have that are how, like how much ATP the mitochondria make um, does not add up to being enough energy for our body to actually do anything other than be a blob all day long. Hmm. Um, and so there's something lacking in the science. There's something major lacking from standard medical understand medical scientific understanding of where we're really getting all of the energy uh, from that our bodies actually use every day, like every, every second. And there's some suggestions out there and it makes sense to me logically, uh, because we're humans and we developed under the sun and with fresh air and minerals and fresh streams. And I believe that where we get most of our energy from is actually from sunlight and clean water and minerals, and then add some fats in there and proteins in there as well, of course. But our, and people can look into Gerald Pollack and there's other researchers and scientists and doctors now that are kind of looking into structured water more, but structured water is really water that's not just at randomness. When we drink um, unfiltered water that just comes out like tap water, regular tap water. It's generally mm -hmm. been stripped of so much of the nutrients. And then, you know, fluoride is usually added in plus other chemicals mm -hmm. to clean it. And so it's like, it's dead water. And that just basically just means that the H2Os are 
in very random um, sequences all balled okay. together. And, but when we add minerals, like the whole plethora of minerals, 70 plus minerals into water, and then add light, it's like sunlight, it becomes structured. Um, add a little shaking in there and it becomes structured. And so adding just a pinch of like relatively toxin-free Himalayan salt or a good quality Celtic mm. sea salt, um, because those have 70 plus minerals. It's not just sodium and chloride. It's got all the minerals. And so you add that just a, a dash, we'll go, we'll be very official about this, a dash of salt, of quality salt into filtered water, very filtered water, even distilled water. This is like mm -hmm. one of those instances where I'm a huge fan of actually distilled water, but then add in the salt and then put it in a glass jar in the sunlight, even just for a couple of minutes, much less like 20 minutes, half an hour. And it's just going to get chock full of photon. Like those photons are just going to go to work on the minerals and the, and the H2O, the water, and then it's going to become structured. And so all suddenly those H2Os are like stacked in a nice sequence. And okay. it's way more hydrating when we take it, when we consume it, it's way more hydrating. So you can actually get truly hydrated because if you're taking, if you're drinking a liter of um, your normal tap water every day, most people are not going to be well hydrated with that. You'll be peeing it out for sure, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you're really well hydrated. It doesn't mean that that H2O is actually going into the intestines, getting absorbed and going inside the cells and hydrating the cells. And when that structured water enters the cells combined with other proteins, amino acids and fats, we get this like gelatinous type of structured water slash gel. And when the light, the sunlight, humans are supposed to be outside, not inside getting fake light mm -hmm. where we're only getting a couple of frequencies, but the, the sunlight has this like full spectrum of mm -hmm. light, visible light and invisible light. So all of these frequencies hit hit us, hit our skin, go into the cells, hit that structured water and create energy. And that is probably where we get the majority of our energy, not just from ATP that mitochondria are making. So that you probably sense. have, uh, yeah, it makes sense. You probably have big glass tea containers. That's the biggest thing I can think of that you could put yeah. this water in and put your little bit of salt in there, set it out in the sun for 20 minutes. Exactly. Is that how you do it at your house? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. And okay. I use other structuring water devices as well. So do you? I mean, okay. it's just get it from a, many different directions for sure. Yoshi, is there, we're about out of time and I know you've got a patient at the top of the hour. You were so kind to give us this block of your time. Thank you. Is there anything else you would like to add when you're thinking about cognitive health and, and how to, how to stay sharp? Hmm. It's, I think I, I mentioned it a couple times, but it's like, it's going back to those, the basics, the lifestyle modifications, right? It's, it's, and it's not that everybody has to get an A plus in every category of exercise and diet, but mm -hmm. it's like, we, we need to be getting a decent grade, a B plus an A minus, you know, maybe some categories or you are getting an A plus in some categories, it's only a B plus, but it's like, we really want to be kind of as close to a 4.0 student in those areas, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of other things that we can do. Ozone, methylene blue, Right. I mean, the world is full of different companies coming up with things that can help our cognition, which is mm -hmm. beautiful. I've tried many of them and I love a lot of them. Um, but at the end of the day, if we're trying to just put those on without taking care of business, mm -hmm. um, it just it doesn't it doesn't make sense. We're going to be spending effort where it shouldn't be guided. Um and so it does, those, those getting good sleep, it's like, focus on that. Like that's probably the number one thing I would, I, it's hard to put number ones. I have a lot of number one things, <laughs> um, but it's like, get good sleep. Number one, yeah. <laughs> gotta be eating well. Number one, yeah. <laughs> gotta be exercising. And it's like all the different types of exercise. It's not just exercise. A, a, a stroll around the block is not nearly enough. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to be working hard, even if it's just for a short time period. Um, and then, you know, a, a sense of purpose, too. It's, it's 
That's so important in the sense of community. I mean, we are social beings and it's very, what I've noticed from patients. And I mean, I can just think to myself, like it's so important to have that sense of community because otherwise life is just not as sharp. And I agree. And, and so, and our cognition is not going to be as sharp versus if we have a community who we care for, who we know they care for us. It, you, you look at the blue zones, right? The people who live the longest, it's, it seems to actually come down much more to do with their community than any other factor for all of the blue zones. It's, it's really that community. And, you know, I'll just kind of end on, there's the the smokers. There's there was a study, and I cannot cite it. I wish I could, but it's like the people who smoke solo; those are who get disease from smoking cigarettes. Hmm. Versus the people who smoke in community with friends, laughing, having fun. There is actually almost no deleterious effect from the cigarette smoking. Which really, I mean, that is just. I mean, that's just mind blowing. Like, and, and so you could be eating a really like organic, whatever it is, like pick your diet, paleo, whatever it is, like this really healthy food. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking negative thoughts, that food is going to go in. You're going to have more dysbiosis. You're going to have a leaky gut versus you could be eating a, I'm not going to say like a French fry. That's really horrible. But like you could be eating non-organic salad mm -hmm. and if you're doing it in community and like loving on each other and, and <laughs> laughing and you're eating it your 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 gut is going to be so happy and healthy and the neurotransmitters that your gut is making and it's going to it tighten up so you don't have leaky gut and you, that food is going to do a better job than eating a healthy food and so it, it really goes back to community and love and purpose um, those are my number ones such a <laughs> great message <laughs> such a great message dr yoshi ram i appreciate your time today thank you so much yeah and thank you for doing what you're doing and spreading the word and helping people and educating people because we all need it it's a sense of purpose it, it yeah. i'm loving it just loving it you have a great day likewise you've been listening to the cutting edge health preventing cognitive decline podcast any information shared here is for educational purposes only guest opinions are their own this podcast is not responsible for the veracity of their statements do not use any of this information without first talking to your doctor Cutting Edge Health, LLC, is not responsible for what may happen to you if you use their information in place of official advice from a medical professional. Thanks for listening. Be well.